Uh, dear friends uh, from all over Europe, welcome to another edition of uh, European Chats. Uh, warm greetings from Brussels. Uh, and today we have the, the opportunity and the privilege to talk to uh, two of our people uh, in Paris and in Vienna. Uh, with me this afternoon is, uh, first of all, Yves Perroncini, who is the, the president of the European Movie France. And he, we are also joined from Vienna by Christoph Lilly, who is the president of European Movement Austria. Uh, both of them uh, long-standing uh, campaigners and activists in favor of European integration and cooperation, who have been working with the European Movement and for the European Movement for a very long time. Uh, without further ado, I would like to start with you, Yves. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to see you again even through a screen. Uh, the first question I'd like to ask is, uh, how are things in France at the moment? Uh, after a few months of dealing with the pandemic crisis, uh, what is the situation both politically but also socially? How are uh, citizens and people dealing with, uh, with the COVID crisis? And um, what is the effects that the, the lockdown has had on public discourse? Well, very briefly, so thank you for the invitation and uh, this opportunity to debate. Uh, in France, the situation is, uh, let's say, if you look at the health aspects, it's under control. Uh, you know, all, around 30,000 deaths, unfortunately, but it's under control, apparently. Maybe waiting for a second wave, but uh, at least at this stage, the post uh, the post COVID nineteen is 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 in is within reach. Uh, economically, it has been uh, supported. I mean, the, the French authorities have been very proactive, but the situation is getting worse and worse. So, in terms of recession, we're expecting uh, minus eleven percent, which is huge. Uh, unemployment will uh, go beyond eleven percent probably. Uh, public deficit up to 11%, public debt uh, 120% of the GDP, so very, very bad uh, economic situation. We don't feel it yet, but it's, it's, it's getting more and more serious, so it's going to be a very, very difficult uh, uh, moment for, fr for French people. And uh, as regards uh, the political situation, I would say that uh, the French president uh, was quite uh, unpopular before the crisis <clears throat> because of the yellow vest movement, the pension reforms protest, and, and many other uh, elements. So he, he, he went through the crisis together with his prime minister. He performed more or less well, but uh, he, he became not more popular, if I may say it this way. And if you look uh, the last local elections uh, recently, last Sunday, of course, uh, it was a blow, a, a, a harsh defeat for him. So we're expecting changes politically, probably a new government, if not a new prime minister, maybe referendum initiatives uh, in the direction of uh, the next uh, presidential election in France uh, in 2022. Perfect. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the elections just now, and if I may, I'll use that as a, as a follow-up. Uh, we, we, we're seeing a, a shifting in the political landscape in France that perhaps mirrors a little bit what has happened recently in, uh, in Germany too. Uh, do you think that is a more permanent trend towards uh, parties from the left, uh, especially the Green Movement, uh, or was it more a mid-term reaction against uh, Macron and his presidency? Well, I think both things are, are valid. I mean, yes, there's a general movement, an international one, in favor of more, yes, more pro-environment policies, pro-climate policies, led by the youth, the young generation, but, uh, well, a massive uh, uh, movement, if I may say. But on the other side, in France, you can add on top of this... Uh, um, the weakness of our political system uh, and, you know, uh, people looking for alternatives. And in a way, Macron was an alternative in 2017. He appeared as a newcomer and the whole world, as he called it, you know, the, the older old parties world were, was defeated. And in a way, what has happened uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday, sorry, 
in France is a bit this kind of uh, 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 phenomena, meaning rejecting the local uh, mayors uh, uh, to put, uh, to replace by Greens, but I must add, not only Greens, because they were in alliances very often with social democrats, sometimes communists, and also civil society organization. But the last point to say that these local elections, it was the second round, uh, it was concentrated in uh, big cities, very populated cities, because for the first round had been had been successful in many, many other cities, you know. So it was only the biggest cities left. And of course, the sociology of the voters is a bit different. And I would say, to sum it up, more greens than uh, in France at large. So we need to see what will happen next uh, regional elections and, uh, of course, the presidential election again in 2022 to see, to know the, the real landscape. That's very interesting. That's very interesting indeed. And I'm sure we're going to touch upon the, the presidential election, even though if it's a couple of years away. But before we do that, I'd like to turn to you, Christoph, and again, also welcome you and all our friends in, in Austria for, for joining uh, the European movement was a very good presence, strong presence in, uh, in Austria. I would be delighted to have you with us. Well, I'll start with asking you a similar question to the one I asked Eve. Uh, how are things in Austria? How is uh, the, the crisis, the pandemic crisis, affecting both citizens but also politics at large in the country? Thank you, Petros, and thanks for organizing uh, that meeting, virtual meeting. Uh, because I think the Mouvement European is an important factor now to create awareness about the necessity of a united Europe and much more uh, to fill up our hearts with perspective and uh, uh, use the engagement uh, of our young people um, uh, for moving forwards uh, Tomorrow there will be a new presidency. Uh, Germany will uh, take over. And uh, uh, Angela Merkel, the new president, uh, these days uh, made a conference with uh, uh, President Macron and they agreed uh, to uh, speed up uh, and uh, to uh, bring solutions because Austria was very quick in reaction for a lockdown, with all the consequences we all are suffering of. But now we have to go upwards. We are, but controlled going upwards. That means now we have to control ourselves. What is the virus doing? How can we keep it in control to have not a second wave? My concern is another one that we get a second wave, but of bankruptcy of companies and increasing unemployment, particularly among young people. And therefore, I'm asking uh, for my movement, European Autrichien, to give an extremely impact for quick solutions. Yes, I know. There are some countries in a different access. Should it be loans? Should it be uh, subsidized? Yes, I know. It's not up to us to, to find a solution for that. But it's up to us to ask the others to find a quick solution, a compromise, like it's usual in um, European politics. And therefore, um, our organization is asking for a quick reaction and I hope that was Macron and Merkel were saying, find a solution in July. I hope that would happen it was, if it will not happen. Many people are losing hope and confidence thanks to the European project. And others will come. Others will come, as uh, Eve has said, they are populists, they are demagogues, and at the end they are waiting for their chance. They had no solution. In this crisis but they are waiting for their chance after the crisis mm. and of course the one of the main purposes of the european movement is to function as a platform from for different stakeholders from all sides of society uh, to come together and craft common solution to our challenges and what a greater challenge than the one we are currently facing uh, 
uh, we, we cannot underestimate the, the human cost of the crisis and Eve mentioned the, the number of uh, fatalities in France uh, and in many other countries uh, and at the same time there's of course an economic dimension uh, to all this uh, and perhaps I can use that uh, opportunity that you gave me Christoph uh, to mention a little bit uh, to discuss a little bit the, the European Union's uh, reaction to all this uh, we touched a little bit upon uh, national politics when we were discussing with Eve uh, but I'll be interested to hear, starting from you, uh, perhaps, uh, Christoph, I'll, uh, I'll use it as a follow-up person. Uh, what has been the, the reaction in Austria vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis the proposals of the European Commission uh, with regards to the recovery fund? Uh, there is an intense debate taking place at the moment. In some quarters, that debate is polarized, uh, and you have a small number of countries that seem to be blocking uh, uh, the more ambitious elements of the proposal. So we'll be interested to hear what's the debate like in Austria at the moment around the Commission proposals. I think uh, that also Austrian politicians are aware of the uh, uh, responsibility they have to bear for the European project. And that means there will be, it will be possible to bridge some gaps. It's number one. But number two is, how can we uh, see the European project in this period of crisis? And that's so typical. In the beginning, in the very beginning, European Union Commission was asking some national countries and members, look, there will be um, an epidemic perhaps a pandemic, and we are ready and willing to cooperate with you. And what did national countries say? No, we don't need. No, we have everything under control. And then the pandemic broke out, and now the same countries are complaining and bashing European Union. You did nothing. You did too late. And, and, and. Where's the voice of Christine Lagarde? If you know her, and I too. Where is the voice? Quick act, quick action. If we do not, we are losing ground. Uh, the forecast of the World Bank for um, uh, uh, decreasing of economic growth rate is minus 5% around the world, but minus 9% in Europe. What a difference. Two, two slow reaction. And the principle of unanimity is, is uh, that what uh, could be in a quick changing world. Uh, a very, very dangerous, a very, very dangerous failure of construction of the European project. And that's my concern. And I hope that at minimum, uh, European Union should have the competence of coordination and reaction if it's a necessity. In each company, you are doing so. Um, and in Europe, we are not doing not. And that's that's what my 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 uh, core question is uh, are we able and willing to do so and i think our movement uh, of european organizations should be the uh, a pillar in in this uh, in this uh, way of uh, new strategy for a new and uh, quick reacting europe it's very true that uh, the crisis has exposed the need for greater solidarity and uh, uh, and to be fair uh, we saw after the initial uh, perhaps almost instinctive retreat to national solutions we saw a lot of uh, the european member states the european union member states pulling together sharing resources helping each other and of course the institutions also played an important role in that there's plenty to be desired and of course it's very important for, uh, for European nations to work closer together. And I think that's where the proposals that the Commission has uh, put forward come in. Uh, and Eve, if I can turn to you now, because 
uh, France, together with Germany, took a very leading role uh, in that whole exercise. They came forward first with uh, their proposals about what the recovery should look like. Uh, so we'll be, I'll be interested to hear a little bit your analysis uh, on those proposals, both how Paris and Berlin have worked together to push forward those proposals, uh, but also how the EU proposals are being seen in a French context. Well, I would say that uh, generally what happens at, at the moment uh, in the economic governance of the EU at large is seen very positively in France since there is this general idea that, well, you know, we should be more proactive economically, that uh, the EU based on rules is something we have to comply with more or less, by the way, but uh, that the most important thing is to build a European power. And then we have one tool, which is the ECB, Christophe has mentioned. The ECB is a federal institution able to react, and uh, Christine Lagarde reacted quite well. Uh, first, she was criticized a bit by Emmanuel Macron, but she corrected, you know, because she had made a mistake. And by the way, she, she said, well, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, but I mean, Generally speaking, the ECB's reactions reactions were seen very positively then in France because it's a matter of reactivity and uh, solidarity, uh, sustaining the supporting the economy. So this is was this was one thing. The other the other element was to see the disciplines lifted on Schengen. But if I focus on the economy on the public deficit and state aid. And th this was seen very positively, of course, in France, since uh, French authorities have problems in, uh, in, 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 yes, in complying their own commitments. And by the way, the famous 3% uh, deficit uh, ceiling. And they like, um, you know, uh, subsidizing uh, the economy. So this was the second part and well, well, well perceived. The third and final, but last but not least, was a more productive Europe. So there were these, uh, these first initiatives made uh, within the Eurogroup, uh, you know, on the short time working uh, guarantee, on the, the European investment bank loans and so on and so forth. But of course, the most important part was this famous uh, recovery plan, which is seen, if I may be a bit arrogant, me, meaning a bit French, which is seen as made in France. Of course, it has been made in close connection with Germany. And uh, if such uh, an, um, an agreement had not been made possible, there would not be uh, such uh, an ambitious recovery plan. But I think the initial idea came, came for, from, from France. And uh, then now it is seen as a product made in France to be sold, if I may say, to the other countries including the most reluctant ones, such as Austria, uh, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark. So there's no real debate in front at the moment. There's a, the idea that Europe should do this, you know, Europe should show solidarity. Europe should show solidarity, by the way, vis-a-vis -vis Italy and Spain, uh, which are very important countries for French uh, uh, people. Um, our president had said at the beginning we should react and, uh, uh, and we should spend whatever it costs, whatever it costs. You know, it was kind of eco to Mario Draghi's statement on whatever it takes. So I think the French mood is, yes, let's do this, whatever it costs, because the situation is very, very, very harsh. We'll see, my final word, at the end, if there are no let's say, more negative reaction, because if I want to mention the Front National, you know, Marine Le Pen, our extreme right, they don't like that much, this kind of solidarity transferring French money to the others. But I would say that at the moment, they are not very vocal because they know precisely that there's a quite a massive popular support in France in favor of such a recovery plan. And then our most important challenge for us at the European movement is not to, to explain this plan. We do. We do it. No, it's rather to say that in other countries of Europe, there are some uh, legitimate concerns. Uh, well, there are well critics, 
reservations as regards, if not the plan in itself, but some elements of this plan. And then that's uh, the pedagogy we'll have to do in the next few weeks, including to explain why Austria, for example, uh, Austrian authorities can have a different stance. But I would say I'm quite optimistic uh, about the final outcome and the fact that the, there will be a compromise and a global compromise uh, uh, sooner or later. Yeah. And it's interesting because quite a lot of polling has uh, shown that uh, by and large European citizens in different member states uh, do want the EU to, to do more. Uh, in many cases, the polling indicates that they're expecting the EU to do more and they're disappointed that uh, perhaps it has not. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting test, uh, like uh, Christoph mentioned earlier, whereas uh, some people used to criticize the EU for doing too much, there now uh, the debate has moved to the other direction and uh, the EU is called upon to do more. I'll, I'll bring in one of the questions that we're getting from our viewers and uh, as you can see from the bottom of your screen you are more than welcome to make your comments uh, whether you're watching on uh, Twitter or Facebook on YouTube or anywhere else. But uh, Elizabeth from uh, Austria in fact uh, has an interesting question with regards to this uh, French initiative together I believe with Germany Italy, the Netherlands, uh, with regards to uh, developing, uh, investing in the in a, in a vaccine for uh, for the whole of the EU, and uh, perhaps maybe this is something that uh, we can use uh, as an example. Uh, Elizabeth is suggesting of how to work. How are you aware of this initiative, where a few member states are going to be uh, pursuing purchasing together vaccines to make them available for the whole of Europe? And how would you view such efforts from the member states? Well, if I may uh, follow up, then I would say that we have just mentioned the solidarity push. I mean, solidarity is not new in Europe. You know, Austria and France are net contributors uh, uh, to the EU budget. Uh, and I, as I've said, it's not under much critics in France so far, maybe a bit more in Austria. But this is more solidarity. In the case of this alliance, the vaccine alliance, uh, this, I, I think, is part of another debate on uh, sovereignty sharing or competence pooling, if you prefer. But France has been pushing hard, and Macron in particular has been pushing hard for a more sovereign Europe, meaning a more autonomous Europe, and uh, uh, based on the idea that we are stronger together, including to, 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 to buy uh, vac vaccines to, 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 to pharmaceutical uh, firms. And so I think this is typically part of this. Uh, we should not only reduce uh, that the French uh, uh, strategy, our dependence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other parts of the world, and especially in the health sector, but maybe on, in some other sectors, and we should also pool our resources together to be more influent, to be more powerful, to have the priority, uh, if not to produce vaccine, but at least to sell the vaccines which are produced uh, abroad. So it's in this context that this uh, uh, alliance has been pushed by, uh, by, 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 uh, by some countries. And I would say it's typically uh, a, a French style initiative given the fact that, we, by the way, we have a pharmaceutical industry and that we believe that the European at large should get more united just to assert their interest in, uh, well, vis-a-vis -vis China, the USA and other very big players. Mm -hmm. uh, Christoph, in your introduction earlier, you talked a lot about the need for solidarity and uh, for uh, European nations to pull together and work together. Uh, what is the sense from uh, Austrian citizens? Uh, is there indeed an appetite for more uh, pooling together of resources, for more investing in uh, supporting other fellow Europeans? Yes, Austrians are convinced Europeans, no doubt. Uh, and uh, they are supporting uh, also the philosophy of solidarity, no doubt. Uh, that doesn't mean that in all questions there is unanimity. Uh, and that's uh, the European project to discuss it and find an appropriate solution. Um, because we have to be aware 
we are speaking of quick reaction. We are speaking of a recovery a plan. But when will it happen? When will it come into reality? Are you aware that if all the uh, members of the European Council are agreeing in July, it will last till end of the year and the beginning of next year, because all national uh, parliaments have to adopt this. And afterwards, there have to be the financial measures to finance this. On the other hand, many companies have no liquidity uh, and unemployment is raising. We have simply not the time to wait. Second point, Yes, we need more cooperation and uh, one learning of the lessons of the crisis is in the uh, industrial strategy paper of the European Union to say, oh, what, what now have we to change? And here the health sector is uh, an important factor. It's a strategy point. Uh, 80% of our pharmaceuticals are coming from Asia. That means we are dependent. That means in uh, the phases of crisis and no one can exclude it also for the future, we are dependent. And in the world of today to be dependent from Asia or other countries, it's not part of the European strategy. Therefore, I'm very in favor uh, to have uh, not only uh, the uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, initiative uh, uh, in healthcare and medicine, uh, which is to be appreciated very much, but we need a strategy also in the healthcare sector as well as we need um, uh, uh, strategies in other in other sectors like uh, digitalization or environmental protection. Um, that's a new sector. We are aware of that since the crisis, and this is one point where European Commission should take initiatives and um, uh, try to find together um, that the members have the. Um, security that uh, they are uh, in uh, not in danger if the next crisis is coming. Mm -hmm. Cooperation instead of isolation. What were all the countries, member countries, doing? Restoring borders. The wrong thing. A virus doesn't know a border. Cooperation would be the appropriate answer, and that should be influential for the future uh, strategy uh, decisions. Of course, uh, and that's very true. We, as the European movement, of course, we are strong advocates of the freedom of Europe and uh, the situation that emerged after the initial lockdowns came into force was quite worrying. And I think if you also mentioned it briefly at the beginning, the, the, the issue around Schengen and the sanctity, how important it is for the European project to ensure that uh, the borders are open as quickly as possible. For the remaining of our time, I would be interested to hear your views too. You have uh, talked extensively extensively about freedom of movement. Uh, how do you see the current situation now, picking up from what Christoph said? Well, I would say we're more or less back to normal. And unfortunately, before, I mean, in, at the very beginning of the crisis, um, well, there was also another type of normality, which is, which is politicians playing with the borders, you know, with emotions. And it's true that emotions are rather national. Uh, there's an emotional deficit as regards the European uh, membership. And so, yes, politicians, and it's not only vis-à-vis -vis a, a virus, it's also true when there's a terrorist uh, attack or migration flows, they believe that the borders can protect us, which is not true. But politically, it's rewarding. So they did it. And then progressively, uh, they realized that, well, that, that, that was generating many problems. So, of course, a border 
control can be reinstated in Europe. This is part of Schengen, by the way. This is not a violation. This is possible. But uh, after some a while, you see that it blocks the, the commuters working in, in, in the neighborhood, neighboring countries. It blocked the truck drivers. It blocked the doctors. It blocked the, the patients transferred to another country. It blocked the, you know, the, 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 the people coming for... I mean, to, to, for the harvest, I mean, and then progressively, I would say the, the pressure for economic interdependence uh, ex, uh, made possible this, this uh, back to normal process we, we are witnessing because now it's more or less possible, if I'm well informed, to, to travel quite freely within the Schengen area with some exceptions remaining. But the summer break, meaning summer holidays, because we are also interdependent for holiday, for holidays uh, and vacations, will help us. But now we should build on this, you know, trying to, to, to assert um, pedagogy on the fact that, as Christoph has rightly pointed out, the borders don't protect. I mean, the situation in France was crazy. You know, people in Strasbourg, they were authorized to go to Paris, where the virus were, were, was very, very high, but they were not authorized to go to Germany, where the situation was under control. So um, I would say the decision makers played with uh, our emotions, but they are also played with our health. And so let's build on this. Let's try to pledge. Let's try to to see that uh, in such a crisis, the good, the good, I mean, uh, local constituency was rather the town, maybe the region, but certainly not uh, uh, the countries. And then their borders with their neighbors. There's a lot to do, you know, it's part of the mythology, you know, including in my own country where we had built a so-called Ligne Maginot, you know, Maginot line to protect us against Germany. Well, with a very, very limited effectiveness, but still the politicians are playing with it. So that was not a surprise for me. I think uh, just another opportunity to witness this, but thanks, thanks are, again, well, economic, and I, I should have had, added, human interdependence now we are back to the real normal which is yeah free free movement of people with it within within the schengen area indeed, indeed. and and also speaking of people that perhaps can be a, a concluding question also uh, civil society played an important role in uh, both the early stages of the spread of the pandemic but also uh, now as we are slowly emerging out of uh, the first lockdowns. Uh, may I ask you to briefly describe what has the European movement been doing in your uh, respective countries? Uh, maybe starting with you, Christoph, if you can tell us a couple of words of the work of the European movement in Austria uh, during the crisis and then going forward. What can we do to learn out of the crisis? First, Protect yourself. Don't wait uh, of obligations from the state authorities. We all are self-respondent people. And second, try to push the recovery plans as much as possible. And we have a European movement have to do a lot for that. All our sub-organizations have to, uh, to demand that urgently. Uh, many are not aware what's coming. What's coming, the big crisis is not the tourism crisis now influenced our southern European countries. The big crisis will be the industrial crisis coming if uh, international um, uh, value change are uh, not uh, functioning, um, coming when uh, uh, the demand is reduced because people are uh, cautious and uh, uh, reluctant to invest in times of uh, insecurity. Uh, you have not the um, uh, power and the will uh, to make uh, major investment. And the third is to rely on each other. And I am convinced European 
And I think we need European solidarity. Solidarity is the opposite of uh, egoism, protectionism, nationalism. We had a history. Look back in the uh, 20th century. Uh, there are so many uh, documents out of that time. How cruel. You um, if mentioned machine line. Yes, it was to build enormous walls against each other. And the nationalists lost the game. Now I am asking, what are they addressing to us today? They have no constructive suggestions, but they want to play on the piano of emotions. And that's what we should, as European movement, a positive motion, playing a positive piano, uh, saying that we are only 7% of the world population. And if we want to survive and be successful and have perspectives for young people, the 7% have to swim together or to sink alone. And to swim together does need to think in bigger dimensions. Uh, it's not a question Austria or Italy, France or Germany. If there is a, a region in France uh, which is suffering, total France is helpful. And if a region or a country in Europe is suffering, uh, total Europe has to be helpful. If we don't have this philosophy and only asking, oh, where is my benefit? What I'm paying, I'm net payer or not, overseeing all the advantages beside, then we will not, we will not succeed. And that's the main, the main thing. People are only able to learn from their lives in critical situations. Indeed, indeed. And if I, if I turn to you, if uh, for the last few moments we have left, um, please tell us a little bit uh, the work that the European Union in France has been doing during the past few months so if i would say uh, as usual you, you wouldn't believe me but i would say uh, pedagogy on what the europe can do or not a debate and uh, proposals to go forward uh, not business as usual more online more on social networks and by the way it was a, a test for us to, uh, our ability to reinforce with social distancing our online activities so these three activities Focusing on on solidarity, subsidiarity as well. Again, to to show where are the responsibilities, competences, member states or EU. So solidarity. You know, it was by the way the 70th uh, anniversary of the Sh Robert Schuman Declaration, which focuses on solidarity. So a lot on this, including through op eds and uh, and, um, and uh, yes, participation on, in online debates. Now we're shifting to sovereignty, sovereignty sharing uh, again uh, in this new world. And, uh, and I think looking at the world uh, can produce more sovereignty sharing. But if I may conclude on one word while uh, listening to Christophe and following him, I think we should now more speak more about identity. Identity is key. You know, Emmanuel Macron said yesterday in uh, Meseberg, together with the Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel, it's because we have a common identity that we sh should share our sovereignty. I think he's right in doing this, in saying this. He did this in the Sorbonne speech, by the way, already. So it's because we look at the world, we can see that we are Europeans. Yeah, we are not that much, by the way, so we're stronger together. But not only we are stronger together, but we are a bit different. We are not Chinese, we are not Americans, with all due respect for, for both of them. We are not uh, like the Africans. We are not like uh, like uh, the South Americans. So, a sense of common identity, and this has to be pledged. Because if I was to to to, to turn back to Austria, of course, I'm sure that there are major differences between Vienna and uh, and Innsbruck. Even if there are, 
there is this feeling of identity. So of course, a common language can help. But then what I mean is that we should be even more active as regards this uh, European identity, united in diversity, of course, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And I think we have started, of course, at the European movement. And for this to happen, we will go on, including in connection with the other European movements with which we have uh, produced some op-eds during the, 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 the COVID-19 uh, lockdown moment, if I may say. So, of course, I uh, will try to go on uh, within the EMI network, which is very, very helpful for this. Indeed, indeed. Well, this is a great way to, to end. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for you. giving us your time and, of course, sharing your insights and your analysis on what's happening right now. Uh, indeed, the strength of the European Movement Network is the fact that we are all over Europe. And we can bring people together uh, to look for common solutions to our common challenges. Uh, those of you who took the time to join in and listen in, thank you very much also for your questions. We were not able to take all of them, unfortunately, but the conversation continues on social media and elsewhere. Uh, so look for the European movement, the European movement Austria, the European movement France, but also other European movements in your countries and get engaged so you can make your contribution and be part of the European future, of a common European future. Again, thank you very much, all of you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Eve. And thanks, Petros. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank.